Good afternoon. I'm Mike Feuer. I'm your city attorney. And you've been listening to the song stylings of our friend James Darren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I hope that one day when I'm making a speech, before I talk, there'll be song stylings from my shower. <laughs> We're going to work on doing that. But that, this sounds much better. So it's very, very nice to have you here. And I want to say at the very beginning, I'll be introducing our panelists in a moment, but this panel, at least three members of this panel, have been all over Los Angeles on their own time, on weekends, engaging with members of the public who are eager for their insight. And I want to say to our panelists, I know that you have lots of other obligations. And to be devoting yourself to be sharing this information is a very special thing. And even though I haven't introduced them yet as individually, give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. So uh, let me just set the stage a little bit for how things are going to go, make a couple introductions, and we'll get underway. So in my career. I've spent lots and lots and lots of time since I first began running a place called Betsetic Legal Services in 1986. And my role at Betsetic taught me at a very early stage in my legal career about the many facets of what it means to age, about how we need to not only fend off being victimized, but more importantly, how we can make sure that in every stage of life we live with meaning and purpose and a real sense of fulfillment. And I learned from often difficult circumstances because the people who came to Betsetic when I was there and still is true now have the most difficult problem they've ever faced. They have no money and yet they desperately needed someone to stand up for them. Those were very traumatic moments for them. And I was extremely proud that 50,000 times when I was leading Betsetic, we intervened and often saved people's health care or houses and certainly their dignity. We were talking earlier today, though, that there's another lesson that I learned from our clients, whether they were Holocaust survivors with stencils in their arms or somebody's grandma in South Los Angeles who got taken advantage of and now her house was being sold. The notion of resilience. We we're talking about how important it is to be able to come through challenges and emerge even stronger. So we're going to learn from each other today about how our minds work, how to maintain our physical conditions, how to have meaning in our daily lives, how to have a sense of mindfulness about our, our routines, and at the same time, some very practical information as well about how we each can be sure we're never victimized. So let me introduce first, uh, just so people know who's who here, Joan Pellico, who uh, is here from Councilman Paul Koretz's office. Um, Joan has been... The, the applause was muted only because I haven't fully described your role with Paul. Um. So Joan has been with Paul for eight years? For 10 years. And in that role, pretty much anything of consequence that emerges from the staff in Paul's office is a testament to, jo to Joan's leadership. So anyway, very nice to have you with us. And do we have our friends from uh, Jesse Gabriel's office as well? So very good. So from Jesse Gabriel's office, um, we have either, are you Myra or Nikki? Myra, very good. Okay, because I have two different names here, Myra. Okay, very good. Uh, Assembly member Gabriel is relatively new to politics. He has a long career as a lawyer, as an advocate, as an activist in the Jewish community, and now he represents this neighborhood in the California State Assembly and is off to a great start as well, a very promising, emerging, thoughtful voice in Sacramento and very focused on the well-being of his constituents here, which is why Myra is here with us today. So anytime you have a really difficult constituent problem, don't talk to me, talk to Joan or to Myra, and then if they don't, aren't able to handle it, no, all kidding aside, each of them has a lot of skill. And my staff is here as well. And let me be sure that Rob and Ivor and Alma each get a 
really vociferous thank you, round of applause for helping organize it. All right, so now let me dive in and introduce our panelists, and then we're going to have a, a program that doesn't proceed like so many that you've been to, where someone talks for 15 minutes and the next person talks. I, I don't find those very stimulating. I'd rather have Q&A that's kind of aggressive, where people are talking to each other on our panel, and we'll engage you as well. So we're going to have, I'm going to ask a lot of questions of our team members here, and then with maybe, I don't know, after maybe 25 minutes or so, we'll have a group conversation. If, however, there is something that our panelists say that prompts you to want to ask a particularly time-sensitive or urgent question, just raise your hand and we'll, we're a very informal group today, we'll just dive in. Okay? All right. So, Susan Strick is here. Susan is, for many of you, very well known because as a deputy city attorney, she's one of the leaders in the country when it comes to elder abuse issues, protecting senior citizens who might be victimized either physically or through scams financially. Uh, Susan's a, well, a long sought after speaker at events like this. But most importantly though, she has one of the most effective advocates and leaders that I know of when it comes to making sure seniors are protected. That's Susan Strick over here, so. Dr. Dan Stone, again, a regular on our circuit here. Um, Dan, do you, by the way, have a mixtape of some of your most compelling hits and songs? <laughs> no one's ever asked. Okay, so maybe next time. So, in fact, we can make that our theme song, maybe next time. All right, all right. So, Dan is a, an expert on gerontology, geriatric issues. Um, he's a specialist with the Cedar sinai Medical Group. He's the past president of both the, Cal the L.A. County Medical Association, District 7, and the L.A. Society of Inter Internal Medicine. You will hear he is an extremely insightful and plain-spoken guy. He's going to be able to convey very complicated issues to you very clearly. For the first time, we have uh, Grace Chen Brown with us. Uh, and Grace ha is the president and CEO of Wise Senior Services. Um, that is a program, which I'll have Grace describe to you a little bit, that has many facets to it, uh, protecting seniors in many ways, including overseeing what's called the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program in our region, which places Grace's team in nursing homes advocating for people who may be victims of abuse or neglect. Very important. Grace, thank you for joining us today. And then um, we have wearing a Cubs jacket for no reason that I can identify. Yeah, Chicago. James Darren. Out of sympathy. Yeah. James Darren, who, as many of you know, is one of our more, most endearing and enduring performers as an actor, as a singer, as a director. Uh, his career dates back to Gidget, but it also includes Deep Space Nine. So think of how many people can, th can say Gidget and Deep Space Nine in the same <laughs> sentence, and it applies to him. And, and it, he, I have to say, what a generous person you are oh, to be doing you. this. Uh, because again, this is, this is like your fifth or sixth time when you've yeah. taken your Sunday afternoon to be moving members of the public learning from you. So let's dive in. Okay, so that's good. Thank you. So we're going to mix it up. We're going to talk about issues of health. We're going to talk about just day-to-day -day living a little bit. Um, let me turn to Dan just to start off with. Um, so Dan, although there are men in this group, there are more women than men before us. And maybe that's as, uh, because women recognize that among Alzheimer's patients, the majority are female. Why is that? So, well, thank, thank you for having me, Mike. And also just to mention, uh, it's nice to be back here at Valley Beth Shalom where my sister was married and I have fond memories of Rabbi Shulweis's teachings over the years. So it's a wonderful place. And thank you for such a wonderful forum you put on for the public, very spirit, public spirited. Um, as far as women, uh, the unfortunate reality for us men is that uh, mortality is higher among men. And so when you get into older and older age cohorts, you see fewer and fewer men. Uh, cardiovascular disease is the, the main cause of death in the United States and men are more susceptible to it. And, uh, and there may be other components. Uh, there are other reasons why. There's a number of other issues that, that befall men when women obviously have their own particular causes of mortality. So um, when there is a, a larger population, there's a larger population at risk. So Alzheimer's disease is very associated, as we all know, with the aging process. 
and at the in the oldest groups of people, it uh, approaches half the people. If you get into you know individuals in their 90s, about half the people will show signs of Alzheimer disease. So, uh, given that there's more women in that population, there are more women at risk. But certainly, I think we all benefit by doing what we can in terms of lifestyle. We may want to talk about that at some point to avoid Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second because you know Maria Shriver, who some of you know. Um, uh, was quoted in the LA Times article as, as saying this, and she's someone who's really been an advocate on so many issues, but also on this one. Um, she's saying, she was saying that, that women have become obsessed with their bodies but have forgotten to take care of their brains. I was speaking, she said, to the head of neurology at Stanford, uh, who said, my waiting room is filled with 70-year-olds, with the bodies of 40-year-olds, but no minds. So tell us, that's a very provocative thing for her to say, a provocative thing to cite from the Stanford professor, and I think we should be intentionally provocative in this discussion so we can get to what really matters. What would you say if anybody here says, so Dan, I want to be sure that my mind is sustained well into my 90s and beyond? I would certainly want to go on record and say women in my family are not, not taking care of their minds, in case anybody were to ask. <laughs> But um, uh, I, I do think there are things, and, and I think that's this question about Los Angeles culture, and I think in terms of you know, materialism and, and superficial aspects of, of life, I think there's, there's deeper questions in there that we could ask ourselves about, about what's important. Uh, certainly, if people pay attention to their minds, I think there are things that they can do. It tends to be the uh, vascular disease risk factors that are also associated with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And there probably are connections that vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease are probably related. We still don't completely understand Alzheimer's disease, but, but um, so uh, exercise, avoiding smoking, appropriate diet, uh, and avoiding uh, hypertension, um, and also uh, behavioral issues like staying mentally engaged. Uh, there's a book called by Gary Small that people might be interested in, a researcher at UCLA, that talks about staying mentally engaged in things that still require you to put mental effort that are new and different. Those things may help to keep people engaged and keep their minds alive. We know that identical twins do not always conform in regard to Alzheimer's disease. They can be divergent. One can have it, one can't. So that tells us it's not all genetics, that there are very important environmental factors that we can fact we can alter our our future history if we take advantage of it and do the right things and grace wants to dive in yeah if i may add um so dr stone talked about uh dr small's work in uh, memory and training and such and actually there is an evidence-based training that is available for individuals that are looking to to just stay sharp and you know, stimulate their cognitive uh, minds and such. And it's a program that for the most part is funded through the various um, cities and or the county's Department of Aging. So what you would look up is UCLA Memory Training and um, out here in the Valley, Partners in Care Foundation uh, does a lot of that work with different organizations and such. We at Wise and Healthy Aging, we're headquartered on the west side. We do a fair amount of that training also and also into other parts of LA. The other is just something as simple as, and you know, my 86-year-old mother-in-law, and oops, I shouldn't have said her age because she's, <laughs> she's, she's 39 and, and holding. Uh, so she, she does something that, that we highly recommend in our own programming that we have in adult daycare at Wise and Healthy Aging, and that is crossword puzzles, all right? Doing the crossword puzzles, doing Sudoku, playing bridge, mahjong, just staying, making your mind active and stimulated. There's also various programs like Luminosity or Dacom that are available that are more web-based or on the computer, but just something as simple as playing cards with friends and doing those kinds of things are also very helpful. And, and James, let me ask you, you know, people are looking at you and saying, wow, I want to remain this vital, this vibrant, and uh, no signs of slowing down. How do you do that? What, what are the secrets that you'd identify in your life? A lot of heavy drinking. Yeah, good. The tea doesn't count. That. Bar hopping, I do that quite a bit. You know, I just, I keep active. I don't want to be alone. I, I, I want to be social all the time. I want to keep my mind active. And as Grace was saying, 
uh, um, do whatever. I mean, uh, learn a new language, play chess, whatever. Just keep yourself active. I, I always find when I'm, if I have even like a couple of hours where I'm alone, to me it's very depressing. Uh, only because I like to keep my brain going. I like to challenge my brain constantly, you know. And um, I, I do whatever I can to, and exercise is important. I mean, that when you exercise your body, it also exercises your brain, you know. Even though it's the most boring thing in the world, I mean, people who say, oh, I love to exercise, they have to be lying, <laughs> right? They do, I mean, who would like it? I get on my treadmill, I don't like it. I, uh, it's probably one of the things I like least, but I know it's doing me good. So uh, I just try to keep active, you know, and, and call you 15 times a day and just, uh, yeah. just keep my brain going. Excellent. Well, so Susan, let me, let me shift gears for a second. I wanted to set the table with a range of issues here. So in your work in our office, however engaged people might be as we get older, Nonetheless, we can be susceptible to becoming victims, victims on the internet, victims on the phone. Help our team here avoid becoming a victim when it comes to internet or phone scams. Well, there, can you hear me? There, there are a lot of um, presentations that we do to educate the community. Um, one of it is keeping engaged with other people so that you feel you can bring forward anything that's suspicious that comes about. Um, and so question, remind yourself to question these things. Talk about it if you think someone calls you or you get a text message or you get um, a email from someone you don't know. Never click on it. You can, it, it. You're not getting that million dollars, right? Or they're not giving you two identical Mercedes Benz. That just doesn't exist. So I think we have to stay sharp. Talking to your children or your, if you don't have children, your nieces and nephews, or your younger people in your life about things that come about. We can't feel shameful when something does happen because we do know that people do get scammed. People are lonely, and the more lonely people are, the more likely they are to answer those calls, those robocalls, and they're more likely to become in their mind more so that they don't have anybody to bounce ideas off of. So I encourage people to, like, like James said, is be active, be, know who your neighbors are. Know if you don't have a spouse um, or a significant other or children, reach out to people. And if you can't reach out, you don't know how to, you can always give us a call, you can give, um, Grace's agency, there's so many wonderful agencies. I encourage you to take one of these that are over there on that table. There's so many great resources. Wise and Healthy, put this out. So there's lots of ways to protect yourself, a lot of specific ways. I don't know if you want me to go into the specifics. Well, let's, let's, but. Let, me, let me just ask, has anybody in this room gotten a phone call or an email message, especially if it's a phone call that says, Grandma? or someone from, okay, good, fair enough. And for those of you who haven't gotten that kind of phone call, Susan is pointing out the importance of not giving away information. The person who's calling is trying to elicit from you enough information to continue the conversation and take advantage of you. Grandma leads you to say, um, if there's a female voice maybe, is that you, Susie? Yes, it's me. Well, you haven't heard that it's Susie. You just provided the information. And the conversation continues. Discuss that scam a little bit, if you would, Susie. So it's called the grandparent scam, but it could be the aunt and uncle scam. It could be any kind of scam like that where you get a phone call usually, and the person says, hello, um, grandma or grandpa, um, how are you? And, you? and when people get older, myself included, my hearing isn't as great as it once was, and phones are notorious for not having great reception. And so you might say, if you don't have a grandchild, you might say, oh, you have the wrong number, right? Because that, and the person usually hangs up. But if you do have a grandchild and you are caught off guard, maybe they call you at a time of day that you weren't expecting any call, you're going to respond to it. And sometimes they say grandma or grandpa, 
it's me. And you say, me who? And you say, it, you know, it's me. And then you go, oh, is it Josh? Oh, yeah, Grandma, it's me, Josh. Oh, Josh, how are you? You don't sound like yourself. Well, Grandma, I'm in some jail in Tijuana, or I'm in, um, you know, I'm in Bolivia now, and um, I've been picked up. And, well, I didn't know you were going to Bolivia. Oh, yeah, please don't tell my mother or father, and they're just vamping. They don't know if, if they have a mother or father, um, that uh, I'm here, but Grandma, I'm in jail, and I need you know, $2,500, and I need it immediately. And so then often people will go to either um, their local um, a place where they can wire money, maybe a bank. They might go to um, uh, a mailbox place that allows people to do that, and then they will send this money. People, we've been educating the people at the banks and at these mailbox places to know that if an elderly person comes in or somebody maybe can't see as well, please advise them to make sure they call the child, the, the, the grandchild's cell phone or the family and ask where that person is. So that's just one variation. You might have gotten the IRS scam. How many of you got the IRS scam? Yeah. Okay, many of you. That seems to be... The My wife got that on the phone and believed it. She was in her, in her car. And, and she got a call and said, it was the IRS. She said, Jimmy, the IRS called me. I said, they will never call you, never. They will write to you, but you'll never call But she actually, my wife was actually falling for it. Well, yesterday, Friday, I, not yesterday, Friday, I got a call on my office line from the Dell IT people. And they said to me, this is my office line for the city attorney's office, and they said to me, um, well, you are using my product, you know, Windows, whatever it is. I go, I don't know what I'm using. We have an <laughs> IT department, and they set it all up. Well, you're on a Dell computer. I go, I look, oh, yeah, it is a Dell computer. And then I realized this is just a hoax. Proceeds to tell me, well, you're on a personal computer. I went, look at guy. I'm not on a personal computer. I'm sitting at my no, office. I Do know. not call me again. <laughs> and I hung no, up. Didn't call me again. Usually they call back, but this person didn't. So... They are very, very interested. You know, it's, I call it the dialing for dollars scams. They and they just is, keep yeah, dialing. There is such a level of sophistication. It is unbelievable. You know, I have gotten an email where a colleague of mine who I work with in the public relations world and such that I've known for many years, and the email says, hi, Grace, this is so-and-so-and-so. I'm in London, you know, visiting, and I got robbed. I, you know, and it sounds very genuine and real. And for a, for a couple of minutes there, I'm really looking at it thinking, oh my gosh, you know, and you would think, yeah, I should be traveling, you know, to, being a tourist in, in London and having this situation and such. So you really have to be careful about these type of things. So they'll come via the email, and the phone, even on your cell phone, in the mail, there it is sophisticated. I've, I've gotten the same thing on the, on my email, saying it was a friend, uh, Marshall Mars, and he was I don't know where, but he needed money right away, and I didn't respond. I hung up and I called Marshall, who happened to be in L.A., <laughs> and I and I said, "Do you do you need money? Are you in trouble?" He said, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's what I did with, with my colleague as I called her. She was at work in the valley. <laughs> yeah, and let me, so I want to just change it up a little bit because, Susan, you used a word that I want to ask Dan about. Dr. Stone, Susan referred to often seniors being isolated. And I want to talk a little bit about what isolation means as we get older and what its impacts can be on us physically as well as emotionally. And maybe you and Grace can respond a little bit about what you'd advise to avoid becoming isolated. Could you help us out a little bit? Sure. I, I think that social connectiveness is uh, very much a, a component of health as, as we get older. And it's easier when we're older to become you know, socially isolated for, for a number of reasons. Uh, in terms of the mental engagement component of this, I think a lot of times people think when they're working that 
um, that retirement or time off, you, know, you take a couple of days off and you do nothing, it feels really good, and then you think retirement or t is like you extrapolate that forever. It turns out that after two weeks it doesn't work anymore. People really need to stay active. We're sort of not built for having an indefinite vacation, so, so there, there's a problem with that. But I think it helps people uh, you know, do better in communities, so, and there's so many opportunities to do that, be it a synagogue like this, now there's online uh, organizations, Sierra Club, hiking, physical activities, political activities, there's certainly a lot to be done positively. It's a great way to use your, your time to help us improve since we obviously need to address all of those issues. So I think the more that people stay active in all of these different areas, pick people need to pick the ones that apply to them and get themselves active and engaged and interested, that helps to keep people moving and healthy. But Dr. Stone, tell it, you've, I, I know in previous conversations, shared the physical impact of isolation. How can being isolated have a direct impact in a negative way on our well-being? physically? Well, I, I think that has, it's in partially uh, related to mood. I think when people are, uh, are isolated, often that's associated with depression. And uh, when we say depression medicine, we don't just mean feeling sad. We mean uh, a condition which affects uh, you know, the activities of daily life, like people's sleep, interest, energy, uh, ability to perform uh, activities, concentration, and so forth. So being engaged keeps you going. There's uh, the drugs that we use for depression probably do the same things in terms of maintaining brain serotonin levels that being engaged and doing things that we're interested in do. So you're, that's, that's, that's almost like a natural drug. That's the way people, I think, keep energized in life is by doing the things that really click for us. If they're all different, we're all different. We all have to do different things. But doing those things that click with you, that energize you, those are going to keep you engaged and healthy. Doctor, I, 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 mean, I think the bottom line is to have a purpose all the time. Am I correct? I think that's an excellent way to put it. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to feel that, you, that you're accomplishing something, you're doing something, makes you feel good. You know, and uh, we all need it. I know I do, for sure. And, and if I may, I, let me just sort of, before I lose that train of thought sitting next to this very handsome gentleman <laughs> here. Actually, on both sides, on yeah. both sides. Huh? Be careful, Grace, uh -huh. because you got, yeah. Including the man standing over here at the podium. <laughs> I want to make sure I got that all covered, all right. right? So there is something about, you know, having purpose, right? And at the same time, I think the, the opportunity as we get older is to take a look at what can we do to give back? So maybe you say, you know, I don't know what my purpose is. You know, I've sort of been there, done that. I've, you know, I don't know what to do, right? Well, how about not so much then about you, but what it is that you can give back? That would be another way of looking at it, all right? We have wonderful programs that are available that, for intergenerational tutoring, as an example, that Los Angeles OASIS, which is a program of wise and healthy aging out here in the Valley. We have a very strong program with the LA Unified School District where an older adult during the school year goes in once a week to one of the elementary schools, is assigned a student uh, to work with and helps that little child um, engage and read and understand and grow and some have found that very fulfilling and that's just one example of some of the things that you can do I think one of the most important things also that is sort of is underlying all of what we've been talking about is we got to keep moving we got to keep moving all right we got to keep moving so moving and engaging our minds and such yes some of the exercise treadmill not as exciting all right however i will put in a pitch for all right water aerobics consider that all right i oh yeah okay so i actually got involved with this over a year ago with the with the ymca out by where i live right and i i went to a class <clears throat> called twinges and hinges for older adults i i will say i was the youngest person there but i will say that at 60 there are the 80-year-olds and the 90-year-olds that were actually kicking butt. They were, I mean, they are fabulous. And so if you have that opportunity, actually being in the water is very good. You'd be amazed at just like, oh my God, I can move and such. So uh, and, before yeah. I take more questions, the very handsome Dr. Stone wants to add a word. <laughs> I, I, that, that qualifies you for referral to the ophthalmologist, right? <laughs> <laughs> or the psychiatrist. Yeah. 
So uh, I think those are great points, Grace. And if, for exercise, I would encourage people to do the thing that you enjoy the most. And, and Jimmy, as you were saying, sometimes if the, the, the thing that works best is something you, you overcome. But if you're on a treadmill, listening to, watching the TV as you do it in a safe way, or listening to, to music, or if there's a neighborhood that you like, take a stroll through the neighborhood. If you like cycling, the water aerobics is good. Try to find some way to spice it up and make it enjoyable. You can go to the mall, just don't eat, okay? Those are different ways to make it enjoyable. Because that's, you know, people will join the gym, and my patients join the gym. I say, well, that's nice, but my patients tend to go two weeks, get busy, and not go. And you have to drive, park, dress, exercise, shower. There's a lot of extraneous time. Walking out the door is great. You're 10 minutes out, 10 minutes back, and you've really done something worthwhile. Isn't that the best thing about a mall, though? You can go to all the different things, the pizza place, whatever. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, the, the exercising, the water thing, that sounds really interesting and fun and almost, uh, I don't know, you have like a great And it's thing. almost all women. Oh, that's more fun, at least for us guys, so for that, sure. That might, that might be an ad, extra added perk. I just want to say something about isolation because we talk about isolation and you're all here. You're all able to get here and be able to interact with one another. I deal with a lot of people, a lot of victims who can't do that. And they are either for financial reasons, for physical reasons, for psychological reasons, and for cognitive reasons. And the isolation can be very, very difficult for them. Um, there's a lot of shame when you can't remember the, your neighbor's name, right? Or that you can't remember um, who or what you're supposed to do next, or letting your house go because you don't remember to clean it or you don't remember to hire someone to help you because you don't have the money. So I encourage you all to be aware of that. If you live in a neighborhood where you see a house that's kind of that you know an elderly person lives in and is deteriorating, you might reach out to that person because that person may be isolated, may be having cognitive issues, may have fallen and been sitting there for five to ten days in their own you know, bodily fluids. And so it's really important to reach out in a safe manner, not just go knocking randomly on doors, but in a safe manner, because there are not, ev not everyone is equally available to address their isolation. And I, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Stone a, a quick question. We all do things that um, seem strange, you know, maybe go to the refrigerator uh, and, and forget why we went there, blah, blah, blah. I mean, today, I was putting my socks in the toilet. Uh, uh, not, not because they belong there, but... but, but you need help. I need help, I know, I, I need help desperately. But I mean, we all do these, these little strange things, and I'm pretty sharp, I mean, I know, I know what I'm doing, I don't... But these little peculiar things kind of shake you up. Yeah. yeah. So I would just say that those are not signs of Alzheimer's disease. People find those things very threatening. Just stupidity. Uh, forgetting <laughs> where you lost your keys, nor not coming up with the name of the person you know, those are not signs of Alzheimer's disease. If you think about memory as having three components, you form the memory, you, you store the memory, and you recall the memory, those tend to be things of, of recall. You can't come up with a name, the word that you want, tip of the tongue phenomenon. Those are recall issues. Alzheimer's disease is, particularly at the early stages, a, a disease of memory formation. So people with Alzheimer's disease don't remember, not because they can't get the word quick enough, it's because they never formed the memory. They'll tell you what happened 10 years ago, but they can't tell you what they had for breakfast. So those, those recall issues are common, they're normal, they tend to start at age 30. We all have them, I have them at least. So uh, I wouldn't worry if you have those, those issues, they're common and not path, not really a, a huge problem for people. This has been a great interchange. I know that we passed over, a couple of you had questions and now there's an additional question. Let's pause for a second this conversation, which is a very rich one, and I want to continue. First, please, and then a microphone's coming to you, then you had a question in the back, and then we'll turn over here, and then we'll return, and we have lots of, lots of questions. Good. So this is a great conversation. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and the, the whole thing of elder uh, scamming is, is a, just terrible to me. Um, I have a company where I'm responsible for finances of elders, and we get a lot of stuff, fishing and that sort of thing. I'm wondering if I can play detective for a minute, if there's any information we might be able to get that could be helpful to you in, in enforcement, and if so, how would we direct that? Susan? So uh, microphone? Thank you. So on this nifty little thing,
this little pamphlet. It tells you to call the Federal Trade Commission. Why? The Federal Trade Commission is not coming to solve your issue, but they collect nationally and internationally types of scams because the scammers come and so they can sometimes isolate where or we see pockets or we see patterns and so they're the ones that can immediately be notified and there's a nine, an 800 number in here for you to to do to you can also educate your the people that you work with about scams um, often someone from my office or the district attorney's office or the consumer department of consumer affairs department of aging all of them can come out and do a presentation to give you some tools to do that I think everyone does it for free um, and so that's another way um, call your local police department unfortunately sometimes the police will say make a report but I don't have time to solve it you know especially in identity theft I'm sure how many of you have been victims of identity theft okay several of you and so it's the, the impossible part of identity theft briefly is that the police officer is looking for you because you are the person that are committing all the crimes. Think about it. Somebody has stolen your identity and they are acting as you in every which way. So who are they going to look for? They run your name, they come up with your address, your social security, your photograph, your place of work. And so it makes it very difficult. These scammers are very, very smart and they're very savvy so identity theft is very difficult to solve but if you if you report it to the federal trade commission they kind of keep track of the new kinds of scams but i do want to say so just really quickly and then we'll proceed to our next question or our next one and so on there are two kinds of work broadly speaking that our office engages in criminal work where we prosecute that's what susan does and civil work which doesn't result in people going to jail, but they may have to pay fines or other issues happen. On the criminal side, we prosecute a whole array of individual cases. There is a victim, and we seek to vindicate her rights or his rights in a prosecution. On the civil side, we cannot represent individuals, like I did at Beth Sedek, for example, but we can pursue lawsuits regarding a problem that affects a group of people or a large number of people. For example, you saw when we sued Wells Fargo. That was an example, that huge case where we sought to vindicate lots of rights. But sometimes there is a company, and a smaller group, or like a, a roofing contractor or somebody else, who has been taking advantage of customers, including senior citizens. And those cases we can pursue, maybe not through Susan's shop, but through a civil lawsuit. And again and again, you've seen in the newspaper how we have done that when people have been the victim of the XYZ business, for example. So it may be that as you are talking with us, it isn't just on the criminal side where there's a detective work element involved, but also on the civil side, because I want to vindicate groups of people's rights, especially I'm really concerned about people who really don't have someone else to turn to. So next question, please. Thank you for all your helpful information so far. And uh, I had a question about our aging population experiencing degenerative problems, it's common, and sometimes they're not so easily treated, which leads me to my question about um, the use of CBDs for seniors for pain management. And anecdotally, it seems that it's extremely helpful, but I don't know if there are other considerations that we're just not aware of at this time, and I wonder if Dr. Stone could address that so Dan, if you would, for those of us who need a translation, what a CBD is, and help our, our questioner with some answers. Sure, so I think it's a great question. CBD is cannabidiol. It's uh, one of the derivatives from marijuana plant, uh, which is different than THC. It's not in the usual dose, it's hallucinogenic, and it, has, uh, it does have a reportedly effects on chronic pain. So, and unfortunately, my comments are going to be mostly what yours are, which is that anecdotally, it, it is, uh, you know, reported to be helpful. And I have a range of patients who state that it's been helpful. Um, unfortunately, we, there hasn't been, because of the legal status of marijuana, there hasn't been a lot of research on CBD or on THC. Um, there's concerns. I think there, there are a lot of concerns out there in regard to the safety of THC and uh, long-term safety. And uh, we're going to be seeing sort of a population experiment uh, as, as the use becomes more prevalent, presumably with legalization. You know, if, if someone tried, and, and the, the, the 
what we have for, for chronic pain is not great anyway. You know, the anti-inflammatory drugs like the leaves and ibuprofen for the senior population, you know, there's risk of, uh, of uh, ulcers and bleeding, there's risk of kidney impairment. Uh, so it has to be used carefully, with best under a doctor's uh, advice. The opiate problem, we know that there's huge problems with opiate use, and opiates are not a solution for chronic pain. So, you know, what do you do? I think that there are, there are, there are other pathways, and I think that we haven't really touched on spiritualism and, and meditation, but I think the sort of medical mindfulness and mind over matter, I think there's a lot of potential for people to get pain relief through non-pharmacologic methods if they're willing to pursue those. So um, it's a it's a... A, a tough problem. If someone had failed other modalities, if it were me, I would probably try CBD. But I think it's best to talk to your doctor. And, and before you, we leave this point, I want to get to our next question in just a second. You, you raised an issue that deserves its own two-minute riff here. We've talked in other settings around Los Angeles extensively because of audience interest about the issue of mindfulness. And what that sounds like to people sometimes is kind of fluffy and may not, it may seem to them as not really relevant to their lives. But I think increasingly meditation, mindfulness is getting a place at the table as we think about the array of things for which we benefit. Help our audience understand in a very practical way how they can become more mindful, what the benefits of, medica of, of uh, meditation might, might be, yoga and that kind of thing. Would you please? Sure. Um, you know, it's been something I've been interested in for years. There was a, a book by uh, Harvard psychologist Herbert Benson um, called The Relaxation Response, and he did a lot of research in Harvard showing how um, alpha brainwave states, which are what we presumably get from meditation, have a number of physiologic benefits in terms of lowering blood pressure and other, uh, other benefits. And so I personally have meditated for years and years. Uh, at, at Cedars, we've been uh, we're sort of exploring doing research with Headspace, which is an app that's a meditation app. There's all kinds of different ways to approach it. There are Jewish meditation modes. There are Buddhist is you know well known. Um, there are all, all kinds of places online you can get uh, online gurus who do like a meditation that's online that you can just go. They'll teach you how. Meditation is a very simple process. The Benson book is 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 quite a good one. I think it's still available um, and. It can help with pain. I think it's very good for relaxation. The Headspace app, which I used personally when we were going to meet with them, I just started using it to see what it was like, and I enjoyed it. And so I, it has modalities for pain, anxiety, uh, and, and other kinds of issues that people face. Um, but I, I would encourage people to explore and find the, the right way for them. Like, like other issues, there's not one way for everyone, but if people explore, I think there are great potential benefits to be had in a number of ways. Calmness, intellectual focus, potentially for pain relief. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, I'm looking at the next question. Does it seem to you that the mindfulness exercises are more important to ward off a problem someone has, or is a mindfulness approach one that is going to lead to more intellectual acuity and just being a sharper person? Can it be both? I, I think it absolutely is both. I think that people do get um, sort of uh, clarity, calmness, uh, and improvement in mental focus. Uh, and I think it sort of depends upon what one needs next and what one's, one's focus is, but I think that those are all potential benefits. Great. Next question, please. I would like Dr. Stone. Um, the information went by faster than I could process it. I'm a bit slow. You were speaking at the time of isolation. However, you also stated, and if I paired it correctly, you, you mentioned a hormone that is generated or released during social activities. And my question to you is, what was that hormone, and is there a search phrase I can use online when I make it to a computer to help my memory jog? Is something tonin or something? Yeah, I, what I mentioned was serotonin. It's actually not a hormone. It's actually a, um, a neurotransmitter. And uh, the, the drugs that we use, the so-called SSRIs, are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They increase levels of serotonin in the brain, and that seems to have beneficial effects on mood, concentration, level of interest. We tend to use them in, in people who are depressed. But my sense has been that when people are, are doing well in life, they're generating their own serotonin. Those things that we do that really connect are probably serotonin, serotonergic for us. They probably 
maintain our level of serotonin. And when people get depressed, they tend to end into, end into, enter a downward cycle. So they do less, they feel less energetic and interested, so they do yet less, and then they feel yet less energetic. And so the SSRI drugs just reverse that. They sort of make you feel like you would if things were humming along when they're actually not. And then ideally, we like to get people back where they're functioning well and doing those things, and then withdraw the drug so they can maintain that on, on their own. Some people can't. But uh, yeah, so if you look online for serotonin, you can probably find a nice little description of its activities on Wikipedia or some or WebMD. You. Yeah, thanks. Next, next question, we have a couple over here, and we'll go over here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I'm, I agree with you, and I read uh, Dr. Small's book, and also I do, I'm an active yoga and meditation and exercise. <clears throat> I do about an hour and a half to two hours every day exercise, mental, physical, everything. And I keep myself very healthy, but I walk every day. Uh, and I had a bad experience that I want to share, very bad experience. The sidewalks, I live in Studio City. The sidewalks are so bad, and they have not been repaired since 20 years. I live in that house for 40 years. And every time I walk, recently I had very bad fall, and I had to go in emergency. I'm still not recovered. My hand is almost gone. My, uh, I injured my knees, my head. I had concussion. And uh, it, it was, I called the city, which is absolutely useless. They don't help at all. 323 three number never works. I lodged a complaint. I told them to immediately go and repair that particular spot. And a month and a half ago, I uh, lodged a complaint. Nothing is being done. And I guess um, uh, Garcetti is not doing anything. I'll tell you what, let, let's, uh, you made a very important point. Let me respond a little bit. I'm gonna save our panelists from, from this one. So, when I was a city council member back in the 1990s, I was in charge of the budget process and added a lot of money to the sidewalk repair budget because throughout our city, there haven't been nearly enough repairs to sidewalks over a long period of time. And in fact, I was the co-author of a measure that voters had before them to create a system back 20 years ago where within 30 years from then, every sidewalk would have been repaired and it didn't pass. More recently, as city attorney, the city was sued by a group of advocates for disabled people over the condition of city sidewalks, just as I was becoming, as I was elected. Uh, we resolved that case. The resolution meant about $30 million or so, which is more than ever before by a lot, every year will now be devoted to repairing sidewalks. However, even though that's a lot of money and much more than used to be devoted to it, it's not enough to say everyone's sidewalk can be repaired right away. With that money, the first priority since we settled that lawsuit has been to fix sidewalks in major public spaces where people come from all members of the public come. More recently, there's been more and more devoted to residential neighborhoods. It's not fast enough and it's not enough for the whole city. What I'd like you to do is just not let the location of that, I, I am not in charge of streets and my job is city attorney, but give one of my staff members, the location of the sidewalk, and we'll follow up. Because one thing, not to digress, not to digress, she's not letting go of that microphone around. Well, not to digress. I have very important thing to tell But let me just say, but not to digress too much from the focus of this discussion, I, I do want to say, in my office, I decided to hire for the first time a lawyer to be in charge of reducing risk in the city. So rather than merely reacting to a problem, we can get ahead of the curve. We're doing some really marvelous things that have never been done before in that regard. None of that, none of that, however, was enough for you because you tripped and fell on a sidewalk. And I really feel for you. I understand exactly what that's like. That happened to my wife about 25 years ago, and she had some very serious problems that incurred from that. For today, no, it's very important priority. It's important to me. And let me see if I can help further. I want to thank you all for all your wonderful information that you're giving us. It really is very elucidating. I, I'm just curious in this room, without getting very personal, how many people in this room have lost somebody close to them who's passed away? So, and now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this time. I'm going to turn to our group, our panel. Dealing with loss as we get older, 
is, I know from my own family's experience, excruciating sometimes. Dealing with loss means grappling with loneliness. How do we bounce back? How do we, it implicates the question of what, what is our purpose anymore? Maybe our meaning was bound up with the spousal relationship that we used to have, we don't have anymore, and so on. I would like, for everybody's benefit here, for each of our panelists who wants to weigh in, give us a couple or three very practical tools we can use when we suffer the loss of someone who is close to us so we can exemplify the resilience that all of us want to. Um, so for myself, just on a personal level, I, I lost my 94-year-old father uh, a year ago on Valentine's Day, and he had lived with my husband and me for the past 12 years in our home. And, uh, and I say this to my friends and colleagues, and I use it for myself, is that when I am in the depths of devastation and grief and such, that to remind myself and, and you know, that self-care, that to be at that level of pain also is a reminder of just the depth in which we can love. And that is what is to be human. And that is what is, that is our life journey. So to be comforted in some way, that to feel that, that loss and depth of pain is that you have loved at a very high level and that there is something there. Certainly to look to whatever faith that is that you have and also to reach out to others. There are various groups. At Wise and Healthy Aging, we have a senior peer counseling program where it's peer-to-peer -peer individuals that we have support groups that are available, whether it's just focused on men or women or transitions or on bereavement, on loss specifically, and also on trans, uh, transitions. Those are also very available. James? You know, aside from the pain, it's someone that you shared things with, you know, that you, that you would talk to almost every day or whatever. Many people, I've lost many people over the past two, three years, dear friends. So the thing is to find, find something new, find new friends, join organizations, do charitable work, anything to keep you interested and happy. I love doing things for, for children, anything. I don't care what it is to help children. It makes me feel great. It keeps my brain working, keeps me active, and it makes me happy. And by the way, I don't know how many of you people here listen to music every day, but in my home, there's music going constantly, whether it's Sarah Vaughan or Joe Cocker. I mean, it's you know, like one extreme to the other. It's just very good to have that going in your, in your life. Thank you. Dan and Susan. I would underline a few of the things that Grace said, that certainly whatever spiritual tradition or refuge you have is good. I think a counseling or, belonged or a, a grief group the, the initial reaction of a lot of people is, it's not going to bring back my loved one. It's not going to, and it, it won't, but, but it does make a difference. It really does make a difference for people to hear other people's stories, to have someone to listen to, to have someone to give advice as to how to get through things. Uh, most people don't need medication. The vast majority of people don't need medication to get through a, a grief or bereavement, but there are a few percent who do, and those people who are losing weight, not eating, you know, as you know, at home who truly have depression can benefit from medication. One of my psychiatric mentors once said, "When someone comes into the emergency room with, uh, you know, if their if their arm is torn and they're bleeding, we don't say, oh, we're not going to treat that because we understand why that is. The artery is open. Of course, they're bleeding. It doesn't mean you don't treat it." And he would say that. Depression is the same way. Just because you know the cause doesn't mean you don't treat it. When it's bereavement, if it goes on for two or more weeks and people aren't eating or sleeping or, or going out, then uh, you know, consideration for medical care or medical approach is worth considering. Susan? Well, you, you, this question is very near and dear to my heart because I volunteer at an organization called Our House, and I run facilitation groups for people who have lost someone. We don't say lost, we say someone died. We want people to be very... Um, this is in the, not part of the city attorney's job. This is something I just do on my own. And I find that the people that reach out and have conversations with other people similarly situated is a very supportive situation for them and those groups go on even when the group is over you have a support group for people uh, that you can call you have a network of people 
because people don't want to hear, oh, I'm so sorry, or you're doing remarkably well, because you might not be doing remarkably well, and they're so tired of hearing, oh, I'm so sorry, and we, as people, don't know what else to say. So if you have a place you can go to talk to somebody who's similarly situated, it's very healthy. And I know that that's just one organization. I'm sure there are many other citywide. Um, and I know that our house has places throughout uh, Los Angeles County. We have about two more minutes left, Grace and then this gentleman. Just real quick, how many of you are aware of 211? So on your phone, you know, you, you have 911 and you have 411. There's actually 211. And if you dial 211 anywhere in this country, uh, depending on where you're calling from, that gets you to community resources. Somebody on the phone answers, and you say, I'm interested in whatever that is, from child care to adult day care, palliative care, support groups, bereavement, and such. It is a county resource database that is used, and they can put you in contact with individuals. Wise and Healthy Aging is an organization that every year we update, we're sent uh, something to update so that for their in their database, they've got all the things that we do and what we do and where we do it and such, and they do it, they have it for all the other organizations and resources throughout LA County. So if you dial 211, that'll get you some information too. Thank you, Grace. The honor of the last question. What I was going to say is that the Devonshire Police Department has a, um, a lawyer advocate that works with the police and for people that's been scammed. I don't know if all the police stations have this, but it's a wonderful service. Uh, she does a wonderful job, and she does get back, and she helps you. The other thing was, uh, on these phony calls, when you know that they're bogus calls coming in, what I've started doing is I just answer the phone, McDonald's, may I help you? <laughs> and if they insist on you know, wanting to you know, try and talk to me, I said, this is McDonald's, how can I help you? And they finally hang up. So eventually they get tired of hearing that kind of stuff. So that, Fair enough. Just, Do you ask if they want fries with that as part of I, that? Well? Whatever they want to order, I'll get it. All right, good. So, so listen, this has been a wonderful, stimulating conversation in large measure because of your participation today in our audience. I want to thank our friends at Valley Beth Shalom for allowing us to have this event here today. It sounds like tomorrow will be yet another opportunity to learn a great deal. In the, as people leave, we have some materials from my office, from the city attorney's office, on hate crimes and on good neighbor laws, all designed to give you as much information as possible so you're empowered to help improve our quality of life for everybody. To our panelists, what a marvelous discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us.